in our hearts and in our lives and would be a blessing. Not from anything I've done or that anything I say, but simply as an act of your grace for us here this morning. Because we know that you are with us by your Spirit. You are present with us even now. And you do love us. Your mercy is your goodness is new every morning. And we can take that promise and experience it today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I was saying, this is the second in our series on the topic of the Holy Spirit. I know we have some visitors here this morning, and I'm, I'm really pleased, glad that you're here. Don't feel that it's going to be a problem that this is the second in a series. I think you'll be able to follow it just fine. Last week, Josh actually started us off. He introduced the series by talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. And he introduced the Spirit as the third person of the Trinity. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, the Trinity is our way of saying that we believe there is one God, only one God. But that one God exists as three distinct persons. It gets a little complicated, but there's one God, one Lord, three per- and but three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a whole lot of theology that depends on that, a whole, whole thing. But it should tell you straight away, even without any further explanation, that the Spirit is important. If you don't have room for the Holy Spirit in your thinking about God, then you, you have an incomplete picture, an incomplete view of God. You're missing this significant chunk, and that is a problem. And because the Spirit is one being with the Father and the Son, holy and completely God, fully divine, the Holy Spirit is involved in everything God does. And as part of that, Josh touched on the Spirit's role in creation, salvation, and in leading and guiding believers. So all of that was last week. I think Josh did a really excellent job of covering a lot of quite important Um, issues. So, if you weren't here, if you haven't heard it, it's available on our YouTube channel. Go and check it out. And that's an encouragement for anyone who happens to be watching online at the moment. But maybe wait until after I finish. Any one of those would make a good sermon, whether it's creation, salvation, or guiding and leading. But I've chosen to focus on leading. Uh, This idea that the Spirit has an important role to play in teaching, guiding, and directing Christians. And that probably won't come as a surprise to any of our regulars because it ties in very closely with what I was saying four weeks ago about the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. But it's more than that, really. I chose the leading of the Holy Spirit because I think it is a vitally important topic for people today. And here I mean not just Christians, everyone. It's that important. Because one of the big questions, the biggest really, that we all face is how do we make sense of the world? How do we navigate life when the world seems so ambiguous, so uncertain, when it's changing so rapidly? We live in a world where trust in public institutions of all kinds, not just politicians or churches, but all kinds, has diminished. Where it seems that any claim of authority is just automatically suspect. We live in a world in which media, and I hear I mean not just not media companies, but just media in its basic sense, audio and video files, have never been more easily manipulated. We live in a world in which lying is easy, And the truth is hard to know and harder still to prove. And look, in part, that comes just, it's just a a fact of life with these new technologies. Technology brings lots of, of good things, but there are pitfalls as well. And this uncertainty is also a natural consequence of postmodernism, which is this uh, philosophy, this idea that, among other things, everything is subjective. Everything is relative, a matter of perception. There is no objective reality. 
But for all that I talk about new technologies and new or well, newish philosophies, because postmodernism is not that new anymore, this idea, this acknowledgement of ambiguity and uncertainty in the world, that isn't new. Not at all. You can go back a couple of thousand years to John chapter 18 and you will find Pontius Pilate exclaiming, What is truth? A statement any postmodernist would be proud of. And of course, in the same gospel, Jesus tells us, I am the way and the truth and the life. And in fact, Pilate himself is reacting to Jesus' statement, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So there is truth. There is certainty. But still our experience, our lives are full of ambiguity and uncertainty. Not so much clarity, black and white, but shades of grey. Why? Because our perceptions are clouded. Because of sin, we are unable to see clearly, unable to choose in ourselves what is right. And that's something that Josh spoke about last week from Romans chapter 8. In fact, our whole situation reminds me quite strongly of an experience I had uh, while hiking in the Lakes District many years ago now. It was late autumn in northern England and very grey. But I had a walk planned. I had this loop that I had all mapped out and I was going out, come what may. If we have, yeah, the slide there, that's the Pike of Blisco in good weather. And when the visibility is good, it looks lovely. But I didn't go out in good weather. As I climbed up the, the sort of the nose of the hill that you can see on the left side of the slide there, as I went up, the clouds came down to meet me. And on the top of the pike, visibility was just a few metres. I lost track of where I was. I, I lost the path. And I got so turned around that I actually accidentally started back down the same path I'd just come up. I only realised because there were walkers who I'd passed on the way up who were still behind me and I saw them ahead of me. 180 degree error. Not a great start. Did I do the sensible thing and head down, go home? No, I did not. Back around again over the pike and on to Long Top. And by this time, I was in the cloud. It wasn't so much raining as just wet and visibility was almost nothing. And you can see it there, that's long top, it's rocky. The path was very faint to begin with and I lost it straight away and this time I couldn't get it back again. I knew I needed to get down below the clouds if I was gonna have any chance of working out where I was. So I took off in the direction that I thought was the right way to go and I headed down the hill. But as I was scrambling on hands and knees down a rocky gully with high cliffs on either side, it occurred to me, if I break my leg here, I could die. Nobody knows where I am. I don't know where I am. And all I had for wet weather gear was a raincoat. If I'm stuck here overnight, I will freeze. I wasn't in any immediate danger. Obviously, I got out okay. I'm here with you today. But it was a seriously dicey situation. In all of that trouble, what did I need? I had a map, perfectly good map, no problem there. But it didn't help because I couldn't get it to fit what I was seeing. On one peak, I got turned around 180 degrees. On the next one, I got turned off 90 degrees as I headed off down the wrong spur. What did I need? I needed a compass. A compass would have told me which way I was going. It would have allowed me to orient the map correctly to better uh, match it up with what I was seeing. And this Holy Spirit is that compass for us. To extend the analogy a bit, Jesus is our magnetic north. He is our truth, our fixed point, and the Holy Spirit is the one who keeps pointing us to Him. How? Well, 
Let's go now to John and parts of chapters 14, 15, and 16. Now, obviously, that's a lot. I'm not going to be reading the whole lot. So just to give you a little bit of context, this whole passage is part of what's known as the discourse in the upper room, where Jesus is taking this one last opportunity to teach and encourage his disciples because he knows he's about to be arrested. And as part of that, Jesus talks about the importance of love and obedience if his disciples are going to remain in him. And he says this, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Now, the word advocate there in verse 16, you may also see that translated as helper, sometimes counsellor. I think sometimes in even some versions you get comforter. But the term varies, but the idea is simple enough. The Father will give you the spirit of truth to help you and be with you forever. And Jesus comes back to this topic of the Holy Spirit in chapters 15 and 16. But here he's talking about not love and obedience, but the world's hostility. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why it hates you. That's why the world hates you. When the advocate comes, and there's that term again, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And then if we skip on to chapter 16, we hear this. Very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you." All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And in these passages, we see that the role of the Spirit in guiding us is twofold. On the one hand, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, the one who guides believers into all truth. And this is what I was saying earlier about the Spirit being the compass that always points towards magnetic north. The positive role of the Spirit is to point us towards the truth. Now, it can only point. The compass can only point. We must still choose to go there, to follow and accept the truth. And most obviously, the truth about Christ, whom we hear the Spirit glorifies. We have to do that because anyone who's used a compass will know you can use a compass to set any bearing you like. It will point north, but you might decide to go somewhere else entirely. But whatever path you choose, a compass will still point north. However far you wander away from God, the Spirit will still point to Jesus and the truth. But as I said, the role is twofold. A compass has two points. In a compass, in a physical compass, that has to do with magnetic fields and the need to balance the needle. But the analogy kind of holds. If the spirit of truth guides us into all truth, it must also guide us away from all lies. And Jesus talks about that in our passage too. When the advocate comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, in different translations, you might read that the Spirit convicts the world 
about these things. And look, that might be a more direct translation, but I've always found it hard to understand. I think the NIV, which is the version I've used here, actually captures the meaning really well. It's not so much about spiritual conviction, about being persuaded and convinced that this is so. It's about uh, rebuke, rebuttal. It's proving those things wrong. The world, which in, in John's writing is humanity separated from and opposed to God, has the wrong idea about all of these things. We are caught up in lies and falsehoods, and the Spirit proves that to be so. Now, the three statements that follow are still not exactly straightforward, and they deserve more time and study than I've been able to give them. But here's some preliminary thoughts. First, the Spirit proves the world to be in the wrong about sin because people do not believe in Jesus. And there's a bunch of different ways you can read that statement. But I think the simplest explanation is probably the best. People didn't believe in Jesus, and that in itself was sin. People don't believe in Jesus, and that in itself is sin. The world thought that rejecting Jesus was not sinful, even that it was good, and the world still thinks that. But rejecting Jesus, rejecting God, is really, it's the beginning of all sin. The next thing that, that we're told is that the Spirit proves the world to be in the wrong about righteousness, because Jesus went to the Father where we can see him no longer. Now, righteousness here, we often think of that term in terms of right and wrong, guilt and innocence, but it also has a, a meaning in terms of right standing with someone and right relationship with someone. And Jesus' opponents in the world, they have their own ideas about right and wrong. And crucifying Jesus was all about vindicating those ideas, proving that they knew what they were talking about, that they were superior. But the Spirit proves Jesus to be right, because Jesus is the one with right standing. Jesus is the one who is in right relationship. And we see that because if Jesus wasn't righteous, there's no way he could have returned to the Father. And finally, the Spirit proves the world to be in the wrong about judgment, because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. The world, with its wrong ideas about sin and righteousness, has reached this conclusion that either God does not exist or that God will not judge. And you actually see that quite a bit. That's not a new idea. You see that in Psalms and Proverbs quite a lot. But they're wrong. They're wrong. There will be judgment. The evil one, Satan, already stands condemned. He has been allowed power over the earth for a time, but only for a time. His destiny is assured. In court terms, we just live in the interval between the guilty verdict and the sentencing hearing. That's it. But we are in that interval. And because we are in that interval, we do live in a world that we experience as ambiguous, uncertain, grey. And if we recognise the truth of that, then it should come as a comfort to us, a comfort that there is one who knows all truth and refutes all lies, one who sees clearly even in this murk where we are lost. And this one is the spirit of truth who is with us and in us and will guide us into all truth. That's why so often if you hear people praying in our church, you'll often hear us asking for wisdom and discernment because that's what God gives. That's what God provides from the Father, through the Son, but by the Spirit. It's the Spirit who makes that a reality in our lives. Now, undoubtedly, there will be people who find the idea of an ever-present, all-knowing guide a bit oppressive. How do I choose what I want to do when there's, there's this guy on my shoulder telling me this is where you should be going? But the fact is that God allows us a lot more freedom than you might think, including the freedom to wander, the freedom to make bad decisions, the freedom not to follow 
where he guides. But more than that, when, you are, when your eyes are opened, when you realise you are lost and in danger, then the presence of a guide is very, very comforting. That's what I found, or in my case, didn't find, on a cloudy hillside in the Lakes District. I would have loved to have someone there who knew what they were doing, because clearly I didn't. And failing that, a compass. And it's what I hope you find as well, not because I want you to be lost or in danger, but because without Jesus, you are lost and in danger. And the Spirit is the one who can show you the way out. In practical terms, what does that look like? I think the Spirit guides us and leads us into truth and away from lies by, not the only way, but probably the main way that I look to, by illuminating, illuminating Scripture. And Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. I have the highest regard for the Bible. I hope that's not controversial, right? I have the highest regard for the Bible. It is a wonderful book. Anyone can read it and learn a lot. There's some great insights into history, other cultures, human nature, all sorts of things. But to really grasp the spiritual realities that the Bible communicates, you need the Spirit's help. And the Bible tells us that. If we go back to the compass analogy, if the Holy Spirit is the compass, the Bible is the map. Lots of information on a map, very useful. But to get the most out of it, to actually find your way, it really helps to have that compass. And incidentally, these are some of my favourite times when I'm reading the Bible, often as part of my sermon preparation, and the Spirit just catches me and says, this, this, see this, know this. Sometimes it's something new. Other times it's a, it's a verse I've read over and over again. But when the Spirit just brings that together, it takes my breath away. <laughs> Often I get choked up. But when I get over that, I get really excited because I want to tell all of you about all of it. The best bits of my sermons come that way, and when it happens, it makes my day. Well, Nick will tell you this. How excited I am when I come out of the study and go, yes! So, there are lots of ways that people seek the Holy Spirit and the guidance and leading of the Holy Spirit through prayer and experience, and a lot of that is valid. But I would encourage you first, and this may seem counterintuitive, seek the Spirit with the Word. Seek the Spirit with the Word. If you want the Spirit to lead, do not neglect reading your Bible. Another way the Spirit leads is through our conscience. And I'm a little bit wary about raising this because we are just so good at deceiving ourselves. I think sometimes we attribute to the conscience feelings and impulses that really have nothing to do with it. But we do each have a conscience and sometimes the Spirit will act to stir that up. So Josh spoke last week about the war that is on inside each of us between God's Spirit and our fleshly nature. And Lockie's going to cover some of that too because when he speaks next week, it's going to be from Galatians chapter 5. There is a conflict within us. And sometimes we get, I don't know, there's a, a sense of peace when we choose to side with the Spirit of God. When we have that sense of leading and we choose to follow it and make the right decision, siding with the Spirit of God, there is a peace that comes with that. And conversely, when we know that there's that leading and we choose to ignore it, when we choose to side with the fleshly nature... There's often a, a sense of conflict within us, turmoil, restlessness, even a sense of illness within us. Certainly, I've known both of those within myself. It hasn't always led me to make the right decision, but I have known the Spirit's leading in those moments, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. 
Now, there is a lot more that I could say about that, but I, I want to move on because I just want to sound a, a quick note of caution before I finish. One of the, the main reasons that many churches are suspicious of the Holy Spirit is that the Spirit's leading or guiding is used as an excuse, an excuse for bad behaviour and excesses. The Spirit told me, therefore we must do whatever. And some of you at least will have seen situations where people claiming gifts of prophecy or healing or what have you have then expected special status or influence within the church. Not every time, far from it, but enough to create a little hesitation. More simply, we know the Holy Spirit is not the only spiritual power at work in the world and the Scripture tells us to test the Spirit's. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. And again, this isn't to pour cold water on those drawn to the things of the Holy Spirit or those who are faithfully exercising spiritual gifts. We need the Spirit. I think we need more of the Spirit. We need the gifts of the Spirit serving the church. But we do need to be wise. We need discernment here too. As Paul writes in Galatians, our freedom in Christ isn't an excuse for bad behaviour. How though? How do we exercise discernment if we're supposed to be testing the one who helps us with discernment? If you're lost, how can you check that your compass is broken? And that happens, by the way, you crack the casing and the fluid runs out and then the needle doesn't turn. Well, Jesus says the Spirit will not speak on His own, but only what He hears. We should expect the Spirit to lead and guide in a way that is consistent with God's Word, God's living Word, Jesus, and God's written Word, the Bible. Basically, the Spirit isn't the only tool available to us. The Spirit illuminates Scripture, but Scripture also provides that benchmark, a means to test the Spirit's. If you think the Spirit is leading you to say or do something that is contrary to the plain testimony of Scripture, either you haven't heard it correctly or it's not the Holy Spirit leading. And the other thing I think that helps us is to look for the fruit. What is the fruit that comes from this particular direction that we're being led in? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So in ourselves, we can look ahead and see where does this leading, where does this guidance end? What fruit will it produce in my life or the lives of others? In other people who claim to be led by the Spirit, what fruit do you see in their lives? And of course, Lachlan is talking about the fruit of the Spirit next week, so I'm going to leave that, except to say just this, it's much easier to trust the leading of the Spirit in and through someone in whom you see good fruit. Much easier. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. So, the Bible tells us, and the experience of Christians through the centuries has always been, that the Holy Spirit does lead and guide. The Spirit of truth guides us into all truth and proves wrong all lies, showing them for what they are. And we need that kind of leading, desperately. In our muddled up, ambiguous, uncertain world, we need the Spirit to point us unfailingly towards truth and towards Christ. We do need to be a little cautious, as I said, because we're not always right in these matters. But we can be more confident than I think we sometimes are because we have the Bible as a benchmark and because we can see the fruit that comes as we follow in a particular direction. And if there is a risk there, it is a risk that's worth taking. More, it's one that we must take for without the compass to point us home, we risk being lost for good in the cloud and fog. So watch for those moments when the Spirit speaks through God's Word. Pay attention when your conscience is stirred and have the faith to trust that lead because it is Jesus 
who has promised us the Holy Spirit, and that promise is good. Thank you. Let me pray quickly as the team comes up to close the service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways in which you bless us. We thank you that you have blessed us through Christ, whose death and resurrection we remembered in communion today. But we thank you also for this gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who was with you in the beginning, who hovered over the waters of creation, who is with us and in us as believers, even now. For we know that wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, there you are with us. And that is the work of your Spirit too. So Lord, I pray that we would not neglect the Holy Spirit, but that we would actually seek more of the Spirit. With wisdom, with discernment, yes, but that we would seek more of the Spirit. Because we need that pointer. We need that consistent direction that will keep pointing us to your truth and to our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.